This is a homily by Bishop Gregory Brewer of the Episcopal Diocese of Central Florida, July 18th, 2013, in Orlando, Florida. If you are of a certain age and grew up in the southeastern part of the United States, or in certain wasp enclaves in other parts of the country, <laughs> you will remember conversations that I remember hearing as a child. Well, you know, I don't understand what all of this piece about wanting equal civil rights is all about. I mean, after all, Negroes really are not exactly as human as we are. Mm -hmm. I heard it. Mm -hmm. And even as, a, even as a, a kid, there was something inside of me that was like, what? Um, even though I grew up very much being taught that uh, by my extended family. It was exactly that attitude that Bartolomeo de la Casa came against in the 15th century. Mm. Uh, Bartolomeo was a Dominican who was assigned as a priest to go and serve in Hispaniola in the West Indies. It was common practice at that point among the Spanish colony for those who were there to be assigned a certain plot of land. And anyone who inhabited that plot of land was automatically considered a slave of the new Spanish owner. And that was the thing that he, when he got down there, discovered to his horror. And Hot just spoke tirelessly against the enslavement of the, the native Indian population that was a part of the West Indies. It got him into enormous trouble. <laughs> uh, he eventually made his way back to Spain, but even there worked in the court of King Charles to eventually, that eventually resulted in the passage of laws that governed the Spanish colonies in the West Indies that forbade the enslavement of the local Indians. Now, did that erase the problem? No, it actually paved the way for the beginnings of the African slave trade to the West Indies. Mm -hmm. uh, because there was still, even in that case, even on the part of Bartolomeo, although he released <coughs> this later, that sense that, okay, if we have to deal with the Indians as humans, maybe, maybe the Africans aren't. I mean, there was that sort of thing that happened. But even then, toward the latter part of his life, he renounced that attitude as well. And that's, that's why we remember him, that kind of fearlessness, because it was fearlessness, which is why the gospel reading about don't fear him, meaning fellow humans, but fear God. Mm -hmm. Because you see, we have a God that really does see all people exactly the same. He cannot do anything other than that because he is good. And goodness is seeing all human beings of equal worth in his sight. Now, it's really easy, quite honestly, for me or for any one of us to talk about what was true for our forebears. It's very different to think about how God wants to get at that kind of attitude in us. Because you see, we naturally want to flock to be with people like us. Mm -hmm. and because we do want to be people like us, be with people like us, it, it's a stretch for us to, people with whom, to be with people with whom we do not have anything either culturally, racially in common. And, and because that's the case, it is also our nature, we 21st century human beings, to like the people who are like us and to be slightly suspicious of those those who are not like us, whether we're talking about a liberal conservative divide politically or theologically, whether we are talking about people who have a different set of cultural presuppositions, different racial backgrounds, there's always that sense inside of us, even though we would never be so bald, bald as to say it out loud, as to think of us as more and them as less than. And it is exactly that piece where we need to hear the gospel as well. We may not be in that sort of shocking position as Philemon was when Paul wrote to him and said, 
You need to be receiving Onesimus back, not merely as a slave anymore. Let, let that one go. But as a brother. Mm. I mean, for him, that would be like slaving to a plantation owner. Your, your head slave over here, he's actually your brother in Christ. Mm -hmm. And you should be receiving him into your dining room. Are you kidding me? I mean, for Philemon, that was a shocking thing to hear from Paul. So we, in essence, are saying by commemorating Bartholomew uh, and to be reading these scriptures is to say, God, I need to be shocked as well. Mm. Show me in my own life where I treat some people less than others, or where my own inner attitude causes me to walk at a distance from other people in a way that really does not reflect your love, your care, or your mercy, because they're <laughs> they're just like us. And get at those parts of me that doesn't see things that way. Because you see, a part of the tinge of the reading, and then I will close with this, both with this, God's going to come and fight his own battles passage that we heard Sue read from Isaiah, or even the, the call to fear him, meaning fear God, in the gospel reading is that because God is good, relentlessly good, and it is in his nature to see all humans exactly in the very same way, with the very same level of ju justice and compassion and mercy with which he has shown us, then he will, in fact, fight against us. If we wind up being, in essence, on the wrong side of that equation, that's a part of what the Isaiah and the Matthew reading say to us. And I don't know about you, I don't want God fighting against me. <laughs> <clears throat> and so what choice do we have except to say, Lord, you know I'm just as much a broken sinner as anybody else. And I need you to work in me that which you desire so that I may see people as you see them. Not as I see them. I mean, it, it happened to me actually not all that long ago. I'm sitting in a room with a couple of guys having breakfast. And they are parishioners in this diocese. Church will remain nameless. <laughs> and I was being, in essence, interviewed. Mm -hmm. What they wanted to know was, that, was I like them? Mm -hmm. Did I fit their social criteria? They wanted to know where I went to school. They asked my opinion on various subjects. Uh, I had no idea that's what I was getting myself into. Uh, but, you know, OK, I'll have that conversation. Mm -hmm. But it was very clear that what was going on was they were trying to find a way, was I on their social par mm -hmm. or not? You may have asked those questions, and you may have been in those kinds of conversations. It's a part of our culture. That doesn't belong in the body of Christ. It just doesn't. That's not how we deal with each other. We are not a club with criteria for membership. We are a radical group of people who choose willingly, by God's grace, to baptize any who will acknowledge Jesus as Savior. And in so doing, fully receive them as a sister or brother in Christ Jesus. One of the sins of our church is that we look a lot more like a club on Sunday morning than we do of the body of Christ, where it is the gathering of every tribe, tongue, people, family, and nation. In this day, especially in this day, of continued polarization around politics and race and religion. More than ever, we need to be a church that witnesses by our membership a multiracial, multicultural body who has done the hard work of discovering that it is enough that what we have in common <coughs> is Jesus. That's my hope. Because I think that's the witness our world needs. Anything less than just makes us look like the junior league. Who wants to do that? So with that in mind, that's why we celebrate and the prayer is work in our hearts, Lord. That please don't fight against us. Change our hearts that we may see people as you see them.
Amen.